The Tom Woods Show, episode 1141. Prepare to set fire to the index card of allowable opinion. Your daily dose of liberty education starts here. The Tom Woods Show. Homeschooling parents, if you're running yourself ragged, it's time to switch to the self-taught Ron Paul curriculum. You get to keep your mental health and your children will get an outstanding education. Plus $160 worth of free bonuses when you join through my special link, ronpaulhomeschool.com. Hi, everybody. Tom Woods here. I did a little poll of folks in my Supporting Listeners Facebook group. You can join that, by the way, via supportinglisteners.com about whether if I were to cover this topic, should I make it a bonus episode or one of the regular episodes? And the consensus was that there's enough interest in this topic among the listeners that this ought to just be a regular episode of the show. Plus, I've got a bonus episode coming this weekend with Ben Settle, who's the greatest guy in the world, pretty much. So I decided to go ahead and do that. So the topic for today, therefore, is this very provocative book called The Dictator Pope, The Inside Story of the Francis Papacy, written by our guest today, Henry Sear. That's spelled S-I-R-E. Henry Sear is a British historian and Catholic author. His other books include The Knights of Malta, A Modern Resurrection, and Phoenix from the Ashes, The Making, Unmaking, and Restoration of Catholic Tradition. Henry, welcome to the show. Thank you very much. Let's begin with a bit of the background here. This book, The Dictator Pope, originally came out under a pen name, and now here it is appearing in the United States via Regnery Publishing under your given name. Can you just explain those circumstances? Well, the name of the book on the book is still the pen name, Mark Antonio Colonna. The only thing is that uh, my real identity has been revealed. I see, I see. Okay, because of course I am looking at the cover right now. I thought there might be a newer version or something. So how did that happen? Did, you didn't disclose it on your own, I presume. No, I, I, I regularly disclosed it to Amazon about uh, a month ago. It was always intended that my real identity should be disclosed when the print edition came out. Ah, okay. So what was the idea behind the pen name to start with? Well, uh, you know, uh, a lot of people in Rome have suffered retaliation for criticism of Pope Francis. And uh, I wanted to avoid that. But more particularly, I I wanted to uh, avoid retaliation uh, on people who uh, have been associated with me or uh, people whom the uh, the Vatican might think have been uh, associated uh, with me because I'm no longer living in Rome and and some of those people are. This is quite astonishing. Of course, this runs contrary to the whole narrative about Pope Francis, the idea that you would live, if not in terror, then certainly in great discomfort at the prospect that he might, or he or his people or sympathizers might come after you. That's very much contrary to the smiling man who who sets aside some of the uh, traditional perks of the papal office. But So anyway, we'll have time to talk about that. Let's talk about... Um, I guess we should start in Argentina. I do want to focus primarily on his years as Pope, but I did find it interesting to read the story about uh, the Pope, of course, before becoming Pope, being a a, a Jesuit in Argentina who is being considered to be an auxiliary bishop of Buenos Aires, and he needs a special dispensation for that as a Jesuit. And there is a report that is written up about his character that has since disappeared But what we have is the recollection of somebody who saw this report, and it is extremely unflattering and could help shed light on the kind of character we're observing in the Vatican today. Yes, well, of course, the the duty of the superior of the Jesuits, Father Kolbenbach, was to uh, give his opinion on on whether uh, Bergoglio would be a suitable bishop. Uh, it, it wasn't to, uh, you know, to, to, to flatter him or to be unflattering. He, he, just need, he, he, he was just called upon to show the character traits which, which would um, uh, indicate whether Bergoglio was, uh, uh, was fitted to be a bishop or not. And his, uh, his decision was uh, absolutely contrary. And some of the, the personality traits that are described, I mean, Use of foul language, things like this, just seem so uh, so unbecoming. But well, uh, th- let's, let's be precise: use of vulgar language. Vulgar language. All right. Let, let's not exaggerate things. Uh, okay, and I I don't want to. I want to be as fair as I can 
uh, even though I'm, I find this whole experience to be so utterly exasperating. It's, it's, it's very difficult to maintain composure when discussing it. But in this story of, of Bergoglio as eventually uh, Archbishop of Argentina, we're observing a man who, I guess, earlier in his career, because of what you call his populist theology, was not viewed as a traditional leftist in the mold of some other churchman at the time, and was apparently his appointment was viewed with with reasonable pleasure in conservative circles, and then he moves leftward. Yes. Can you describe how and why that happened? Well, um, how it happened, you know, he, he was appointed uh, Archbishop of uh, Buenos Aires, and gradually he, he um, began to uh, uh, abandon the, the defense of uh, traditional Catholic orthodoxy, for which he'd been known before, and uh, present himself as a, as a more liberal figure. Now, if you ask me why it happened, this is the great enigma of uh, Bergoglio's career. The, the only um, explanation that I can think of, uh, which is the one I give in the book, is that uh, it was the last years of uh, Pope John Paul II. Uh, it was assumed that the next pope was going to be a liberal. Uh, and, um, you know, um, moving into the liberal camp uh, would put Bergoglio uh, onto, the, onto the winning side. Um, if, if that's not the right explanation, I, I, I don't know of any more plausible one. And yet he has filled these shoes so expertly, so effortlessly. He, it seems as if he's lived his whole life this way. But, of course, there have been other books written about Pope Francis by conservative Catholics who have complained about his political leanings or they've complained about his movements in doctrine. Your focus, I, I want to make sure I don't, I don't drift too much into the subject matter of these other books. I do want to focus on his leadership and his style and uh, things of that, that nature. So let me ask you about the question of him, Bergoglio as papabile. Presumably he was on the table, so to speak, as a candidate back when Ratzinger was elected? Is that, were there people pushing for him even then? Absolutely. The, the St. Gallen group uh, chose him as their uh, candidate back in 2005. Uh, they didn't succeed then, but they did, did succeed in uh, 2013. It was, it was the same people working for him both times. What was his role in that? Now, he wasn't a member of this uh, so-called St. Gallen Mafia, as it came to be known. No, because they, they were Europeans, and, uh, uh, you know, he, he, he couldn't uh, go to St. Gallen once a year as, uh, as the others could to take part in their meetings. But, nevertheless, uh, we must presume he's familiar with the existence of this group and sympathetic? Uh, well, certainly familiar with the, with the individuals. I don't know to what, to what extent he was um, uh, aware of the uh, of the goings on of the group, uh, but uh, there there were um, cardinals such as uh, Murphy O'Connor, who uh, um, quite openly said that they were supporting him uh, for the papacy, uh, and um, uh, Bergoglio was well aware of that and and accepted the candidacy. Were there I seem to recall, and I, I think it's in your book too, uh, I seem to recall the impression that uh, Bergoglio at the time was giving the impression that it was very much against his will that he would go to Rome and uh, and this and that, while at the same time he seems to have been engaging in machinations of his own behind the scenes. What's the truth to that? Yes. Well, th th this is um, uh, one of the things I quote from a, a very revealing book, uh, El Verdadero... Francisco by Omar Bello, uh, an Argentinian. He quotes a, a, a priest who's a friend of uh, Bergoglio uh, in the run-up to the 2013 election, saying, um, um, Bergoglio is saying, um, you know, he can't be bothered to go to Rome, he's old, he's tired, and, and I know that he's, uh, he, he's plotting uh, like mad. Well, that's Jorge, says, uh, says his friend. And, you know, this is the... Uh, response of somebody who knows him well. When we start to talk about the papacy, the pontificate of Francis, and we look at some of the decisions made, sometimes personnel decisions, for example, in some of the Roman dicasteries, it seems as if 
sympathizers of the old regime. And in this case, the old regime is the Benedict XVI regime, which by the standards of uh, Cardinal Ottaviani, even the Benedict XVI regime would have been considered liberal. You're right. But he, he's removing people, uh, particularly like around the Congregation for Worship and replacing them with obvious sympathizers. Do you feel as if the, the leadership style of Bergoglio is driven simply by his frankly, authoritarian nature, but it, or is it authoritarianism linked with an ideology? Uh, yes, the latter. Uh, it is authoritarianism uh, li- linked with ideology. Uh, clearly, he wants to um, surround himself with people who are going to support his revolution in the church. Now, what about some of the cardinals who voted for him who were not, of course, the vast bulk of them are not in this small St. Gallen group. I am inclined to think that a number of these cardinals probably voted for him because maybe they are a bit to the left of center or they just heard that he is very, very concerned about the, the poor and that appealed to them. But I wonder how many of them, it's impossible to know, may feel like they have a case of buyer's remorse at this point. Oh, um, I think most of them have. But I, no, I don't think it was a, a question of uh, uh, concern for the poor. The 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 real concern in 2013 was reform in Rome. There had just been a a secret report that had been delivered to uh, Pope Benedict showing an appalling state in the uh, Roman Curia. And everybody knew that the finances of uh, of the Vatican badly needed reform. And basically, the people who voted for Bergoglio saw him as a, a reformer uh, I, I don't think the uh, question of concern for the poor came into it m- much. So when he becomes Pope, of course, we have the highly unusual situation of ha- having Pope Emeritus Benedict the Sixteenth. This this whole situation is extremely bizarre, and it got much more so probably within the past month or six weeks with that whole episode where the Vatican had doctored a photograph of a letter Benedict had written, yes. appearing to endorse the Francis papacy far more than he actually had. This is uh, very disturbing. And and yet, even though Francis is clearly moving very systematically, and if I may say so, mercilessly, to undo much of the Benedict legacy, it's interesting that although Benedict feels like he can occasionally say a little something He's been mostly silent, and all he would have to do, if you ask me, is somewhere offer the Mass according to the liturgical books of 1962, and that would say to the world all that needs to be said, yet he won't do that. Uh, I don't know about that. Do do you know that um, Pope Benedict doesn't say the old Mass? I think he probably does in his private quarters, but if he... Certainly, he's not going to be disapproved to say a mass publicly wherever he wants to. If he had a big public mass in the old right, and as I say, I think in his private masses, he does use the old right, that would be saying something in an age of a pope who has sympathy and mercy for everybody in the world, except traditional Catholics who want the old mass, who are attached to a fad, and whom he takes none of the pastoral care to understand that he extends to everybody else on earth. You're absolutely right, yes. So I, I think Benedict XVI remains a, a big puzzle and, and mystery here. Do you have any insights, by the way, into the question of his resignation? Is, should we really take it at face value? I think, uh, basically, it was that uh, Benedict had been there uh, in Rome in the last years of uh, John Paul II, when he was really not capable of governing the church uh, properly. And... Uh, um, Benedict was determined that the the same should not happen again. Now, on top of that uh, came what I referred to just now, this awful report about the dreadful corruption in the the Vatican. And uh, Benedict just felt that he was too old uh, to cope with it himself, and he wanted the election of a younger man who, who would be able to cope. Let's say something, if we could, about the synods on the family, because this is really where so much of the controversy surrounding him has arisen, even though you wouldn't have to be confined to those synods to find material that's uh, objectionable. You can listen to the interviews the Pope gives. You can listen to his Angelus addresses. I mean, it's just, it's just a font of 
bizarre statements that wind up, half of them have to be clarified by Lazervatore Romano the next day. And I always, have, I know this sounds flippant, but I say to myself, whoever the official clarifier is at the Lazervatore Romano, why don't we cut out the middleman and make that guy the Pope and it'd be a lot less confusing for everybody. <laughs> but all the same, these synods on the family seem to have been carried out with an iron fist in the background. Oh, yes. Uh, it, it was uh, v- very much uh, political control, uh, uh, you know, uh, um, rigging the synod so, so that the, uh, uh, the liberals uh, were in a majority. And um, the, the whole procedure was directed towards um, uh, uh, relaxing uh, church uh, teaching on, uh, on the family and, uh, and on chastity. I was particularly interested in this story, uh, which I recall at the time, of Cardinal Casper, who is known to be on the left, who had rather disparaging things to say about the African hierarchy, saying, uh, going so far as to say, we, you know, they shouldn't say too much about what what it is we need to do, that they're they're uh, committed to backward taboos and things like that. And when a journalist reported these remarks, and the African bishops were quite horrified that he had been saying such disparaging things. Cardinal Casper apparently at first denied having said it, and then the journalist prepared, uh, presented a recording of his words, and then he had to apologize. This is a, so this is a uh, prince of the church who openly lies, openly lies. I mean, yes. who knows what he does in secret? Yes, you're absolutely right. But this is typical of liberal superiority. They regard themselves as, as an elite uh, who uh, are the only ones who properly understand uh, how um, Catholicism ought to be interpreted. And, um, you know, they are there to um, dispense their wisdom to the rest of the church. I'd like to get your thoughts, I'm sure you're going to run into this question quite a bit, on Cardinal Burke, who had been in charge of the Roman Rota. So if we're talking about the legal system of the church, this is a very significant position. And then he was clearly and obviously demoted by Pope Francis in what could not possibly be mere coincidence. And now he occupies a very interesting position now, because even though he is, he has been demoted, in a way, all eyes are on him because he has been, well, as outspoken as a cardinal on the right generally has been. I mean, there have been cardinals on the left who have been unhappy with the previous couple of popes, but on the right, they generally stay quiet. So it's a bit unusual for somebody like Burke to have emerged. Well, uh, Cardinal Burke is saying uh, what he has always said. Uh, he, he's uh, uh, he's uh, speaking out on Catholic doctrine as it's always been uh, understood. Uh, the the uh, the exceptional thing is that um, under the present papacy, he um, uh, you know he's 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 regarded as um, an extremist, and that's what's changed in just a matter of a few years now. The concern that I think some people have is that you could imagine, for example, in the American case, maybe you have one bad president. Now, I don't know. I, I think you have a whole bunch of them. But but let's suppose you had one. There's no reason that the next president couldn't undo what the first one did. The trouble here is that the pope chooses the very people who are going to vote to replace him. And the question is the influence that now Francis wields over the College of Cardinals. That is to say, how many members of the College of Cardinals are direct appointees of Pope Francis? How many more are coming? And depending on how long this pontificate goes on, you know, the, as, as the Francis Cardinals pile up, it's uh, Katie bar the door, so to speak. Yes, uh, of course. Uh, um, one can't guarantee uh, um, who one's uh, successor is going to be. The, the last uh, similar case was uh, with um, John the Twenty Third, who managed to appoint more than half the um, sacred college in, in the brief five years that he was Pope. Uh, even so, um, and, and he, he uh, intended uh, Cardinal Montini to succeed him, but even so, the election of Cardinal Montini wasn't a foregone conclusion. Um, cardinals are not necessarily going to uh, follow the line of the Pope who um, appointed them. Um, many of them have a, have a mind of their own. Well, that's true, but it seems to me that when you're trying to carry through a revolution, which 
Francis clearly is. Um, you're not going to be as, let's say, well, let's think of it this way. John Paul II appointed some people who I just, I, I can't understand why in the world he would want to appoint them. And on the other hand, sometimes he appointed perfectly good people. Whereas when you have a uh, just a, a revolutionary who is single-minded, He's not going to be that way. He's going to find people who want to carry forth the revolution. He's not going to say, well, in the interest of fair play, let me make sure all interests in the church are represented. I just don't see that happening. I think I think it's much more likely that he's going to bring about a college that's going to replace him with a Francis II. Now, of course, we have to wait and see. We can't know that. Uh, now, a lot of this stuff, though, when you talk about it, will seem like, well, this is just, uh, you know, th- this is some obscure Catholic argument that's going on about the inner workings of the church. But I'd like to know, from your book, could you describe maybe two or three incidents that you think most capture the, as you put it, the dictatorial nature of this pontificate? Um, Well, as far as the dictatorial uh, nature goes, uh, you know, there there was the uh, uh, well-known case of three officials of the Congregation uh, for the Doctrine of the Faith being dismissed uh, in person by uh, Pope Francis. And uh, in general, you have the atmosphere of, uh, of fear that exists in the, um, in the Vatican, because nobody knows when the, the same may not happen to them. But when I uh, depicted um, Pope Francis as a dictator, I, I wanted to draw attention to his background in Argentina, uh, the way he is um, a, a political pupil of the dictator Peron, uh, and uh, and indeed um, he showed his dictatorial tendencies when he was uh, Archbishop of, of Buenos Aires too. I recall an episode. Now I can't remember the name of the journalist, but he's a very very well known Italian observer of the Vatican who had written something critical about the Pope, and he wound up getting a telephone call from Francis himself in which, according to all accounts, the Pope thanked him and said that he needs to hear criticism, and he knows that this criticism was offered in a spirit of love for the Church, and he appreciates it. So we do have an episode like that. So somebody could cite that against you and say, well, look, that's a very generous act. Maybe previous Popes wouldn't have done that with their enemies. Well, uh, if I receive a telephone call from uh, uh, Pope Francis uh, saying that, I'll be extremely edified. <laughs> I'd like to get you back on the show after that call comes in, as a matter of fact. I'll, I'll let you into the secret, yes. <laughs> but, th- I mean, w- I hear cases of, uh, you know, religious orders being attacked, and of course, we can't know all the circumstances. Sometimes there could just be rot and corruption all the way through a, a religious order that, on the, on the face of it, looks very orthodox and vibrant, and so we can't know all the circumstances, so we do have to reserve a bit of judgment in cases like that. But given that there is corruption and rot all over the world, and yet it seems as if there's a targeted attack only on, or primarily on, orders that tend to be most orthodox, it doesn't seem unreasonable to think there's an agenda at work here. Now, can you give us any stories about this kind of thing? Well, what you say is is absolutely right. Uh, The the prime example of a religious order, which is suffered is the Franciscans of the Immaculate. Right. Now, uh, no, nobody uh, could accuse them of corruption. Uh, what they suffered for was their decision to uh, um, return to the old liturgy. And they, they were treated I- I- in a very uh, tyrannical way by, by the man appointed to, uh, to visit them. Uh, and I, I draw the contrast between the way they were treated and the treatment of the legionaries of Christ, who, um, I mean, there you have a clear case of corruption. The the founder of that uh, order uh, was an appalling man. Uh, This was discovered uh, towards the end of his life. Uh, He he was guilty of all sorts of uh, sins, and yet the legionaries of Christ were were handled with kid gloves. The big difference between them and the Franciscans of the Immaculate is that the legionaries of Christ have a lot of money, and the uh, Franciscans of the Immaculate were a a, a prime example of a genuine vocation of poverty. What about uh, the the 
what happened with the Order of Malta. There was some intervention regarding a personnel matter. I'm sorry, I don't remember the details of that incident, but it, it does seem to fit, and I know you treat it in the book, it does seem to fit this mold. Yes, but I mean, there's, there was no uh, um, real uh, issue of uh, corruption there. there. There was something that was done wrong, which was the distribution of condoms in the charitable works of the order. Uh, and the Grand Master attempted to correct, uh, to correct that, and he wanted to dismiss the uh, official who had been responsible during, during the years that it happened. Uh, what happened was that um, uh, Pope Francis then stepped in, uh, forced the Grand Master to resign, and uh, reinstated the man who had been responsible for the condom distribution. Well, um, this doesn't um, send a very good signal about Pope Francis's devotion to Catholic moral teaching. Well, that's true. I think it's more the, the question of the, the way these things are carried out. I mean, I'm pretty sure that the intervention there was, I don't know, in defiance of established procedure or something like that? Oh, certainly. Uh, clearly, whenever... Uh, Whenever the Pope uh, asks the head of a religious order to, to, to resign, that will be a um, completely um, uh, exceptional intervention. Uh, actually, what, what was more illegal, what was totally illegal, was the intervention of the Secretariat of State, where they declared the acts of the uh, Order of Malta uh, invalid, the, the government of the Order of Malta invalid. Now, uh, you know, the, the, the status of the Order of Malta was designed sorry, was defined by a document uh, issued by the Vatican itself in 1953. And it declared that the, um, uh, the authority with competence over the Order of Malta is the Congregation for Religious. Uh, it didn't attribute any authority over the order to the Secretariat of State. So Cardinal Parolin, the Secretary of State, was acting completely illegally in, in intervening in that way. How would you contrast with specific examples the style then of Francis with his two immediate predecessors? I could imagine, again, a casual observer thinking that John Paul II was some kind of authoritarian. Most people believe that, by the way. They believe he was an authoritarian. I, I just I don't see that at all. I think he treated almost everyone with kid gloves, with relatively few exceptions. But how would you respond to people if you were to try to explain the difference between Bergoglio and not just a whole bunch of his predecessors, but the two most people living today are most familiar with? Well, what distinguishes Pope Francis is, that, is his complete disregard for the rules. Uh, this applies to, um, to law, canon law. It applies to theology. Uh, Francis goes in um, with the attitude, I, I don't bother about this. Um, and this is what sets him completely apart from uh, Pope Benedict, who was, of course, very much aware of the uh, of the doctrinal um, heritage that that, that uh, he was called upon to uh, uphold, and also from uh, John Paul II, who uh, uh, wanted to do things also in a legal way. So we we have a completely new phenomenon in the papacy now. Meanwhile, we have Cardinal Burke, who was part of a group of four cardinals, two of whom I believe are now deceased. Yes. Who were uh, proposing so-called dubia to the Pope, that these are statements they want clarification on in light of, uh, well, particularly the document Amoris Laetitia, and they want some, they want a, an answer because one thing the Pope is, is good at is ambiguity or uh, plausible deniability. I never said X in so many words. Yes. But yeah, but footnote 87 seems to say X. Uh, the, the flowery document seems okay in some particulars, but that footnote, <laughs> so they want some clarification on it. I don't know. I mean, now there are only two of them in the whole world. I mean, this is the, this is the thing. I mean, at the same time, we, I guess we should recall that at the time of the English Reformation, only John Fisher stood up and said, you know, a, a, a alone among the hierarchy, stood up and said, something's wrong here. But to see so few cardinals be willing to say, we need to get answers on these fundamental questions. I wonder what Cardinal Burke's next move really is. He, he's been talking about a formal correction of Pope Francis. 
I don't know. Do you have any thoughts about that? Carlton Berg is in, a, in an extremely difficult uh, situation. Of course, um, uh, probably the main object in Francis's intervention in the Order of Malta was to undermine Cardinal Burke as uh, patronus of the order. So um, uh, Cardinal Burke has been left uh, isolated. Uh, it's much more difficult for him to act now than it, than it was two years ago. Um, I, 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 I'm really not in a position to uh, advise uh, Cardinal Burke how to act. But what I would say is uh, all um, Catholic uh, prelates and clergy who are concerned about the way uh, Pope Francis is behaving uh, need, need to, to show that uh, concern when the occasion arises. You know, it may be a document like uh, uh, Amoris Laetitia, or it, it may be this uh, recent apparent pronouncement of the, uh, of the Pope uh, saying that there's no such thing as hell, no, no, no eternal uh, uh, punishment. Um, w whenever anything like that happens, it is necessary for Orthodox Catholics to say, uh, you know, this is completely unacceptable because otherwise uh, Pope Francis is going to think that he can just do whatever he likes. And it doesn't help that both Catholics and non-Catholics alike think papal infallibility means if the Pope's favorite color is green, then yours had better be green. I mean, this is not even remotely what it means, but I think somebody like Francis has exulted again in the ignorance of the public on questions like this, because when the Pope speaks, everybody assumes this is authoritative and this is the very embodiment of Catholic teaching, and that's been the source of, uh, I mean, that I think is how they carried through the post-Vatican II revolution. They took advantage of the fact that they knew that traditional, normal Catholics would, in a spirit of obedience, go along with what they were told, because the, these are their superiors in, in whom they must repose their confidence. And boy, was a lot of mischief carried out uh, as the result of that. Now, you have a, a site up with some uh, interesting bullet points from the book, dictatorpope.com, that people can check out. The book, of course, is The Dictator Pope, The Inside Story of the Francis Papacy. I will also link to it at tomwoods.com slash 1141 for today's episode. And uh, Henry Sear, thanks for your time today. It's been a great pleasure. Thank you. All right, everybody, before I let you go, here's a great, wonderful new website. It's going to be of interest to people who live in a particular area, but nevertheless, even if you don't live in that area, I think you're going to be happy to know that this place exists. The website is CNB, B as in boy, cnbgarage.com, named for CNB Garage, which is an automotive repair shop in Tyanesta, Pennsylvania. That's northwestern Pennsylvania. It repairs all makes and models of vehicles, all levels of car maintenance, oil changes, brakes, exhaust, tire mounting and balancing, four-wheel alignment, AC repair, computer diagnostics, engine and transmission repair, all down the line. But in addition to giving you excellent service for a fraction of the cost you'll pay at a dealership, they also, in addition to maintaining modern vehicles, have experience repairing antique and classic cars. And that goes back to Model T and Model A Fords, 60s Camaros, Chryslers, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, all down the, the line. So if you have an antique or a classic car and you need an experienced mechanic to maintain it for you, then CNB Garage is the place for you. They have a 10% off coupon for new customers. Just enter your email address at the bottom of the page. But if you're a Tom Wood Show listener, and of course you obviously are if you're hearing this, and you live near the Tyanesta, Pennsylvania area, then just tell them you heard about CNB Garage on the Tom Wood Show and you'll get 25% off your bill. So check that out at cnbgarage.com. Get your own shout out by getting your web hosting through my link. You get a very good deal on it, so you save money and you get my bonuses. Uh, I give great bonuses to people who start websites and who listen to my show. Find out about them and how you can get them over at tomwoods.com slash publicity. Tomorrow, Bob Murphy returns to the show. We're going to talk about public choice economics, which teaches us just how perverse the political world really is. You thought it was perverse, but it's even worse than you think. I'll see you tomorrow. Become a smarter libertarian in just 30 minutes a day. Visit TomWoods.com to subscribe to the show for free, and we'll see you next time.